As commentator Rex Murphy pointed out in the Globe and Mail, whether you agree or disagree with lawyer journalist Ezra Levant, he is the number one advocate for and defender of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of thought in modern Canada. When a story breaks, Levant rarely believes everything he reads or sees. His new book reflects his tireless digging to get behind the headlines and beyond the spin. It is called The Enemy Within, Terror, Lies, and the Whitewashing of Omar Khadr. It is my pleasure to welcome Ezra Levant back to Studio 4 to tell us more. Still stirring up trouble, eh? You know what? I knew very little about Omar Khadr until about a year and a half ago when I started reading about his trial. And I felt like I wasn't getting reports. I was getting love letters. I was getting press mm. releases. I was so frustrated. I could tell that, I, that the press gallery had sort of... Well, you know, sometimes women who fall in love with death row inmates and proposed mm -hmm. marriage, mm -hmm. I felt like the entire press gallery had fallen in love with Omar Khadr. So I started from scratch. I thought, who is he? What did he do? And what should we do to him? And it's, that's where this book came it's from. It's almost like he has child soldier stamped across his forehead. And you say, not a child soldier, uh, a global uh, jihadist, a hardcore uh, global terrorist in his soul. So let's start at the beginning. Who is he? Sure. I mean, you're very wise to, uh, to point out the difference between a real child soldier and Omar Khadr. A typical child soldier is usually from Africa, kidnapped from his own family, maybe mm -hmm. 10 or 12 years old, handed a gun, usually hopped up on drugs or booze to disorient him and told, you point that gun and shoot or we'll kill you. That's a child soldier. That's not Omar Khadr. When Omar Khadr was captured a few weeks shy of his 16th birthday, he was very much in control of his life. He loved this jihadist destiny. He wanted to go to heaven to get his 72 virgins. He wanted to kill Americans. He was trained carefully in poisons, in weapons, uh, in building IEDs, those improvised mm -hmm. explosive devices. And that one fateful day in 2002, when uh, U.S. forces were in Afghanistan, they called out on a loudspeaker, everyone in the fort, you can leave now, we won't shoot you. Men, women, children who don't want to fight, you can leave and we won't shoot you. Most of the people left, not Omar Khadr. He stayed because this was going to be his glorious day, Fanny. He would finally murder an American, so he hid there. And when the Americans came in, he threw a grenade, killed uh, U.S. Army medic Christopher Spear, blinded another, and when the Americans were standing over him, you know what he said? F you, Americans, shoot me now, because he finally could go to heaven. That is not a child soldier, Fanny, not in reality and not under law. And you suggest he was not brainwashed, uh, not in any way, not by his family. Let's start there. His father, his family, the connections. Well, no doubt about it, they were a crime family. and uh, It would be like Omar Khadr was the up-and-coming young godfather. I mean, his mm -hmm. father, Ahmed Khadr, did the mosque circuit in Canada fundraising for Osama bin Laden. They were family friends. So sure, Omar Khadr went into the family business, but he wasn't duped, he wasn't brainwashed. This was a passion of his. And his father was not there on that fateful day in Afghanistan forcing him to do this. He was there on his own, and he was well-trusted. I mean, we have captured Al-Qaeda home movies showing mm -hmm. Omar Khadr posing with a gun, assembling weapons on his own. He, he's very thoughtful, uh, a brilliant man, F speaks five languages, trained in sophisticated techniques. He was no infant. Uh, memorized the Koran oh, yes. in Guantanamo. See, when he arrived at Guantanamo Bay, and to this day he's been the youngest uh, terrorist there, mm -hmm. but he has the most respect. Number one, he's murdered an American, which is sort of like a notch in his belt. Number two, his family was friends with bin Laden, so he's regarded as, as sort of a kind of royalty. Number three, as you say, he leads the religious services. He's the most fundamentalist man in the joint. Any question that Omar Khadr was the one who lobbed the grenade that exploded in uh, Sergeant Spears' brain? If any there question? If there was any question, it was answered when Khadr himself confessed to it, and Khadr's own lawyers approved of the confession. So this wasn't some jailhouse sign here. Well, Omar Khadr has had top legal help paid for by the Pentagon since the day he was captured. They approved this confession. One of Khadr's lawyers was here sitting in that chair, uh, U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, believe Navy. Kubler. That, that's right. He's gone through a series of them, and he has a Canadian lawyer named Dennis Edney. Dennis Edney has said twice that his client, Omar Khadr, needs to be de-radicalized. When your own lawyer is afraid of you, Fanny, we Canadians mm -hmm. should be afraid of him, too. And that's actually what motivated me to write the book. Omar Khadr pled guilty and got a sentence of 40 years in prison for murdering an American. But just before that verdict came down, President Obama cut a deal with him for eight years in jail. That's, that's too short. But then just before that came down, the Canadian government agreed to take him after one year. So here we have a convicted, confessed murderer, unrepentant, 
that could be transferred to Canada any day now because he served his one year in Guantanamo Bay. He could be on the streets here in Vancouver literally in a week. And uh, not de-radicalized. His own lawyer says he's got to be de-radicalized. He's, he's more radical than ever. I was fascinated by the uh, forensic uh, psychiatrist who has interviewed him uh, time and time again, and he suggests that he is a hardcore global jihadist. If you do the checklist about, you know, a, a jihadist, uh, they believe that Islam uh, is should rule the world. Yeah, it wants us all to live under Sharia law. There are three tests that Dr. Michael Wellner was this forensic psychiatrist, mm -hmm. the, really the top, the top. Uh, a cr a criminal mind analyst in the United States, and he says there's three general criteria for whether or not a terrorist will reoffend. Number one, do they show any remorse or any regret for what they did? In Omar Khadr's case, not at all. In fact, in prison, Fanny, he would say to his guards, oh yeah, when I'm feeling low, I just relive that murder in my mind. It makes me feel good again. That was the Murdering that American soldier was the best day of his life, Fanny. That's mm -hmm. creepy. Number two, how religious is he? Is he de-radicalized? No, he's more fundamentalist than ever, and he rejects U.S. Army Muslim chaplains that want to show him a moderate way of being Islam. He won't even meet with them. And number three, who's his family? Who's his support group? Back in, here in Canada, his dad died in a hail of gunfire. His brother was injured. Did, dad died in Afghanistan? Yeah, dad in Pakistan. Or Pakistan. But Pakistan. the family, he's still got his sister named Zainab, and, and his family's still pro-jihadist. So you've got an unrepentant murderer who's more fundamentalist than ever, and his only support group has been fellow terrorists in Guantanamo Bay and his pro-terrorist family in Canada. This guy's a ticking time bomb family. Well, one, one sister had Osama bin Laden post 9-11, I believe, on her Facebook. Oh, yeah. Uh, saying, you know, now we need to go. Zainab Khadr is Omar's sister, and she wears the niqab, and she's, mm -hmm. and, but she's been interviewed on TV, and it's even more chilling when she looks through that little slit and says, you know, we support al-Qaeda, we support Osama bin Laden, every young Muslim should grow up to learn how to be a sniper. She said that. That's terrifying. And mm -hmm. this is the welcome arms to which Omar Khadr would come back. They regard him as a hero for having murdered. Well, remember, their dad was a fundraiser for mm -hmm. Bin Laden. Yes. If Omar Khadr comes back to Canada, I promise you, Fanny, he will do the mosque circuit just like his papa did. He will be a propaganda victory for Al-Qaeda. Imagine this, a 20-something guy strutting, strutting around town saying, yeah, I murdered an American. Yeah, I stared down the U.S. Army. Yeah, I beat the rap. I'm, I'm free and you can do it too. Well, are you suggesting he'll be the poster boy? The he, new he poster boy? Is. He'll go on the public yes. speaking uh, he'll, circuit. He'll do campus lectures. He'll be he'll be awarded honorary doctorates at universities. He'll be a pundit on TV. His story will be turned into a movie. He'll become a millionaire. He's already suing the Canadian government. He will be a propaganda victory. I don't know whether or not he will murder again. Dr. Michael Wellner says there's a high risk of reoffending. But even if he doesn't murder a single other person, and one more would too, be too many, right. he is a moral victory for Al-Qaeda. Well, surely CSIS and, uh, you would think, uh, CIA and, and the intelligence would say this boy or this 25 man, now, this 25-year-old, is still a high, high risk. He's a terrorist. He will continue to be a terrorist. But that's not enough in our system of laws to keep a man in jail. That's the crazy thing, is he was supposed to spend 40 years in jail, but Obama sprang him, and Stephen Harper mm -hmm. agreed. And that's the, that's the weird thing. Okay. Stephen Harper went all the way to the Supreme Court to try and keep him out of Canada, but when Barack Obama asked, well, will you take him? Harper said yes. Mm -hmm. But what was in it for Obama? Let's start there, for well, President Obama. Well, What's in it for him? In 2008, when Obama was running for president, he said he'd shut down Guantanamo Bay right away. He'd say, get out of the war on terror. He, he spoke very much like a peacenik, to be sure. frank. Well, now here he is, his three and a half years in, he hasn't shut down Guantanamo Bay. He realized being a president means being responsible for the safety of Americans. But back then, he wanted to make this Omar Khadr problem go away. A Western terrorist, youngest guy in Guantanamo Bay, he just wanted a him Canadian. Out. Yeah, he just wanted Omar Omar mm -hmm. Khadr gone. And remember, a lot of other terrorists at Guantanamo Bay were sent home to their respective nations, half of whom mm -hmm. have committed terrorism again. So uh, Obama just wanted them gone. And you know what? When the President of the United States asks you for a favor, you better have a good reason to say no. Uh, usually. Said, yes, Harper but uh, yes. Uh, back to uh, Guantanamo because the waterboarding incidents were there, and I, I think it has been proven that the three men prisoners of war were waterboarded, but not the others. How was Cotter treated? He was not uh, or waterboarded. Do you know? There were only three um, uh, captured terrorists, one of which was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind mm -hmm. behind 9-11, mm -hmm. that were waterboarded. 
Omar Khadr was not waterboarded. He was not a high um, um, value capture. I mean, he didn't have mastermind plans. He was, he was just an almost 16-year-old kid who murdered someone. Uh, so he was not tortured at all. And at his trial in Guantanamo Bay, they tried to claim he was mistreated. The judge threw it out. He simply wasn't. In fact, Guantanamo Bay, uh, I mean, it, it still is a prison, but they just put in a $750,000 uh, soccer field, they have Sony Playstations, big screen TVs, he has gourmet meals every day, literally. He says, I want Parmesan cheese on the side, I want a special spice from Saudi Arabia, and they do it for him. And, and they get top-notch medical care, I mean, he's in perfect, he, he has, he requests a certain brand of dandruff shampoo, he, I mean, he, his life there is the best life that most of the terrorists that have ever had. The average person in Guantanamo Bay, the average terrorist, puts on 25 pounds. They're fed so well. Mm. So is Carter an exception as as to how he's treated? Is he treated better than the others? Well, he Do sort of runs. He he runs the place. Like I say, he's the youngest prisoner there, but he leads the religious services because he's mm -hmm. held in such high regard. He's he's a brilliant mind. He's an evil mind, but he's brilliant. Right. I I compare him to Paul Bernardo, the murderer. Paul Bernardo was evil but smart. That's a terrifying comparison, a combination. Same with Omar Khadr. Omar Khadr was able to outfox the first five or ten of his interrogators. He didn't even admit to who he was mm -hmm. until they showed him videotape evidence of him building these sure. mines. Omar Khadr is unrepentant. He, in fact, he has a sense of grievance. He feels he's been hard done by. He thinks what his father did was noble. He wants to live up to what his father did. And at his sentencing hearing, he refused to apologize for his mission. Why would he apologize for his deeply held beliefs? Well, why have we not seen, and I hadn't read anything about it until now, the confessions of Omar Khadr? Well, this why is, is it not reported in the press? That's What's the subtext going on? of this book. I call this book Terror Lies and the Whitewashing of Omar Khadr. Omar mm -hmm. Khadr is a terrorist, and he's a particularly mean one. But the whitewashing, the turning him into this little lamb, that's just as interesting a story, Fanny. The press, which we rely on to tell us the of straight course. goods. You are is, the press. Well, I'm part of it, but the, <laughs> but the, the, the consensus media, mm -hmm. let me use that phrase, the folks right. who have all agreed that this guy's a little lamb, they circulate a photo of Omar Khadr from a, that his mother handed out from his junior high school yearbook that makes him look like he's 12. I mean, they're, they're, this whole narrative, oh, he's just an innocent little lamb, he didn't mean any of this, he was hard done by. They do that to discredit the war on terror, to discredit Guantanamo Bay, discredit our soldiers, discredit our intelligence agencies. He, Omar Khadr is a weapon, but he's been turned into a media and political weapon too. Mm -hmm. Does he know it? Oh my God, yes he does. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Wellner, the psychiatrist we referred to, he spent two days with Omar Khadr, videotaped the whole interview. He says Khadr regards the media as pieces on a chessboard. He calls the media mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda assets. That's what Wellner says uh, Khadr thinks. Of, I'm going to move the Toronto Star over here. I'll move the CBC over there. Omar Khadr is smarter than half of his critics. Who agrees with you on this? Who is on your side? Well, I'll tell you who doesn't. The Bar Association doesn't. The Consensus Media doesn't. The Liberal Party doesn't. Well, w w until they were out of power, they agreed. Mm -hmm. When they were in power, they agreed with keeping Khadr in Guantanamo Bay. Right. They turned, but, but on the other hand, most Canadians, I think, don't want this little terrorist free on our streets. They want him in prison, not just for the moral sanction. Sure. But do you want him walking by uh, no. schools in their town? Not after reading this. No. Uh, but uh, how was this little terrorist trained? When we come back, we'll go there because he is trained definitely to um, uh, be a well-trained sociopath, if you know what I mean. You know what I, mean? I call him the James Bond. Of Al Qaeda, he has the kind of skills and training that is high. he mm -hmm. is like a Navy SEAL, but for the other side. Well, they're all trained to say I've been tortured. Yes, whether they have or not, I know that. That's right. I, not that I've been trained, but <laughs> I've I've heard. Okay, Ezra Levant, our guest, the enemy within, terror lies, and the whitewashing of Omar Khadr. After this. <laughs>